So solidarity is not just an empty word in Laos. It can be an empty word, like everything can be. But you saw it in the COVID epidemic, the the payoff of this decades-long investment in building people's sense that they can act together with solidarity as a group. So during COVID, like entire villages were deciding on their own quarantine and isolation strategies. You know, I cannot imagine that from where I live in liberal Australia. I live in a small town of a thousand people, similar size to Gandon. I cannot imagine us having the capacity to sit down together and say during the pandemic, you know what, we could be free in our village. We just need to stop help people from the city coming down. Why don't we just put a quarantine sign up on the road and not let people come in? <laughs> like we do not have the organisation capacity to, to make decisions like that. So whereas in Laos, people are constantly asked to, to work together to decide on their own local self-governance questions. So like road maintenance, for instance, routinely is the responsibility of the people who live next to that road. And so, you know, one day a year, everybody will have to go out and work on the road. So you could say, oh, this is just a continuation of Corvée. And in many ways, that's how I, I saw it when I first arrived in Laos. But what I now see after a couple of decades of living there and seeing the pay- payoff during COVID is what these sort of regular routine administrative practices are doing is giving people the tools to solve problems locally through cooperation. And I just think it's it's tremendous and it's so inspiring. Hello everyone, it's your host Tony. Welcome to part two of my discussion with Holly High on the often forgotten, forgotten the West that is, Socialist Nation of Lao. We'll continue learning about Lao, also known as Laos, or the Lao People's Democratic Republic, through a recent and excellently detailed work Project Land, Life in the Lao Socialist Model Village. If you haven't already done so, please do check out part one, which is entitled Lao, the Revolutionary Origins of the Forgotten Socialist Country. You do not want to miss that episode, as it lays out some of the historical groundwork for our talk today. We'll be continuing directly from where the conversation last episode ended. We were on the subject of the culture of the ethnic minority Gantu people in Ugandan and what their experience of the Socialist Revolution has been. This episode will be discussing the nature and experience of Lao culture and socialist democracy. We'll be talking about terms like culture and policy and what they mean in Lao and in the wider socialist tradition and how that differs from the liberal notions of those concepts. We also cover what political participation looks like in Lao today, including what being a one-party state means in practice, democratic centralism, consultative democracy, and much more. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform to get new episode notifications. Also, feel free to leave a review if you have time. To all those who have done so, thank you. These podcasts are made to be listened to and shared. Also recommend checking out the back catalog when you have the chance. The opening interlude for this episode is from a 1975 UPITN documentary filmed in Laos shortly after the conclusion of the revolutionary struggle in 1975. Early morning in Vientiane, capital of Laos. Though it's before daybreak, organizers of the communist Patet La movement are out in the streets beating the drum to summon people to a very special meeting. A celebration of Indochina's latest revolution, the end of Laos's neutralist government, and its replacement by a totally communist regime. The response was impressive. Over 40,000 people marched into the national stadium, passed posters showing the final triumph of Lao nationalism over American imperialism. As the crowd waited for the revolution's leaders to arrive, they sang patriotic songs, led on by Patet Lao officials. Laos has always been a country of many fragmented cultures, and the development of an overall nationalism allied to communism has been deliberately encouraged by the Patent Lao to solidify popular support for the revolution. When the new rulers eventually made their appearance, the crowd was treated to a discourse by Pumi von Vichit. He and a succession of speakers all referred to this moment of destiny in Laos's history. Celebrations ended with both rulers and rule giving clenched fist salutes, and the stadium rang to shouts of Samsoy, victory. The new prime minister is Kaysen Pomivan, general secretary of the Lao People's Party and it's generally believed he'll have more influence than the new president on the future course of events. It's 
been clear for many years that Laotians couldn't hope to regain their ancient prosperity without first learning to live in peace with each other and then working together for a common good. Both these conditions now seem to prevail. The new Prime Minister has said he wants to get rid of the old corruption, integrate the long-neglected minorities and create a truly national consciousness. But he's also made it clear that the first aim will be self-sufficiency in food. The Laotians, it seems, are going to have their revolution, but they're going to have to work for it. What were some of the practices, so, you, so you'd explain their animist beliefs and their taboos around certain things, which were, you know, oppressive in various ways. But what are some examples of that? Because you've explained some of like the taboos around other people coming in, stuff regarding the, you know, the sacrifices of animals, etc. What else was there? Was there things in regards to, like say for example, how women were treated in a hierarchical sense or anything like that, patriarchy? Yeah, so it's quite difficult to reconstruct what things were like before. And I have a long meditation in the book about what we even mean by before because these people's involvement in the 30-year struggle was, you know, so long that are we talking about before 1945 or before when they moved in 1996 or, yeah, what are we talking about? A Japanese anthropologist has speculated that maybe one of the important things before, like based on sort of regional ethnography and what we know about other groups that were very similar, probably these people previously practiced second burial, which is sort of a double mortuary ritual cycle where when, when somebody first dies, they're sort of laid out in one area. And then after a, a fair amount of time has elapsed, then they're moved to a tomb. And when they're moved, there are these rituals which assign these people as very distant ancestors. And they're kind of removed from social life that way. And he speculates that second burial was discouraged or became impractical during the war for or what, for whatever reason, people have no recollection today of second burial. But what they do have is ancestors who never seem to leave social life. <laughs> like when I was there, it was, and also when this Japanese anthropologist was there in 2001, the ancestors were a very big part of everyday life and causing a lot of suffering. It's like they didn't have uh, the ritual apparatus to move these people on so that they no longer bothered them. It's interesting that throughout, throughout Laos, I would say death rites are about moving people on. For instance, one of my favorite things to do when I go to a remote village in Laos and interviewing them, and I always like to tell them a bit about what Australia is like as well. And I said to them, do you know in my country, in Australia, people actually go to graveyards and visit their dead relatives and people are like, whoa, <laughs> that's so full on. Because in a lot of these upland areas, the graveyard is the place that you will you only go to if you're burying someone. You never go there unless you have to. And like people like leaving the graveyard after a funeral or something, they'll wash themselves, wash their hands, and they'll say things like, you know, leave, leave us alone, leave us alone. And in Gandu rituals, when people are addressing their like sometimes their own mother and father, like very recent ancestors, will say things like, you know, you're vile and disgusting, go back to where you should be, you know, don't bother us, the living, do you know what I mean? So there's this, it's, it's sometimes difficult <laughs> for Westerners to understand how much ritual in Laos is about getting the dead to go away and also trouble that, that comes about when the dead don't adequately leave when they're dead. In terms of the position of women, this does have a, an effect in the current day in that the ancestors are often understood to be insisting on people behaving in a certain way with certain sort of morality and they can get very easily offended if they perceive some sort of breach of good behaviour and often the repair for these breaches is a hastily arranged marriage and often for girls who get married off young, say 15, 16, this means they don't get to continue with schooling, they have to move in with their in-laws and start working for them. And a lot of young women told me stories about how they felt that this was, you know, a disastrous moment in their lives. And so some examples for weddings that I saw when I was doing my field work, um, in like in the past, over the last 20 years, things like, you know, one woman became a widow and then people started saying that she liked this other guy and she didn't think that she did. But um, a diviner consulted her dead father and he said that he'd heard people gossiping about his daughter and he couldn't stand that and therefore, you know, she had to marry this guy that everybody said that she liked but which she denied. 
So that's that's one example. What's another example? Oh, there are so many in the book. Oh, another example was a man who was young and single got a girl's telephone number. He'd never even met her. She lived in another village. But somebody passed his telephone number on saying, oh, she's ethnic Gundu too. And then someone in the family got sick and they went to see a diviner about why this person was sick. And in that process, he admitted that he had some girl's phone number. And they were like, aha, that's it. The ancestors are saying that you mustn't flirt with girls. And so those two were married and they'd never even seen each other. So the way that ancestors operate is they make people ill in the family. It might not be the person directly involved. It could be your aunt or your mother or some some relatives. Then there'll be a process of divination to try and figure out the cause of that illness. And very often it's the ancestors have taken offense at how people are behaving, often around young people, romance, that sort of thing. People's choice about who they will marry is sort of taken out of their hands because it becomes a life or death situation. Like, well, don't you want your aunt to get to get better. Well, if you do, you have to marry this woman sort of thing. So that's what I saw in the current day. Historically, there are still people that I know today who were married because of debt arrangements. Part of the slavery system was debt slavery. And I think you can see traces of that in the in the way marriages were arranged, in that people would often settle debts by arranging a marriage in the next generation. So then uh, those examples that you just provided of modern day, would you whip out who was one of your the people that you uh, you know interviewed extensively while you several of your trips there. He explains that once their community had embraced socialism, they got rid of 80 percent of their traditional activities and beliefs, but have maintained 20 percent of it. So would you say that those things in regards to the ancestors and, you know, their conception of the, how their ancestors still impact their lives today is an example of that 20%. Yeah, that's the example he used. And the other example he used is um, the efficacy of buffalo sacrifice. So he said, you know, often there's an illness in, in a Gandhi person and they'll go to the hospital and the hospital will be confused and won't be able to give a diagnosis. But, but then a Gandhi person will take a piece of white string and tie it around the sick person's wrist and say, look, I don't know which spirit or which ancestor I've offended, but I promise promise you a buffalo sacrifice and then the person instantly becomes better and they and they're like well like you know take this as a sign that that you know there's something real about the efficacy of buffalo sacrifice and then the process is just figuring out who through divination figuring out who the buffalo sacrifice should be directed towards you know this was a surprise to me because in the english language literature i'd read before going to this area i had read things saying oh the socialists have made buffalo sacrifice illegal eves goodno said that and he was, you know, he's quite an authority on the south of Wales. So I wasn't expecting to see so much buffalo sacrifice, you know, especially in these people who consider themselves a model village and really passionate members of the socialist revolution. I wasn't expecting them to be having this sort of cultural revival of like much more buffalo sacrifice even than I think that there was historically because I think what's going on is that people have higher income now. I would say that this village isn't, by Lao standards, it's not a poor village. It's like a middle middling village and Laos is heading towards becoming a middle-income country. It's by no means prosperous by our standards. These people aren't, you know, hand-to-mouth existence. They have a bit of extra cash now and they're spending it on this cultural efflorescence, (laughs) like buffalo sacrifices and sort of extravagant weddings and rising bride prices are coming back. These things which I had been led to believe had been outlawed, but far from being outlawed, they're actually being, you know, facilitated in many ways by the by the privileged position relatively that this village has in the country. So I always find like, uh, I feel like this has come up so many times as I've done this podcast is there'll be some idea that's out there that's promoted in some way that ex-socialist country Mm-hmm. Um, with their all-powerful ability to do things and to impose things on people, to force people to do things. But then when you actually look at it, like your own experience, they don't, one, they don't even have the ability to do so. And two, it doesn't seem like they're they're trying that hard to prevent people from doing whatever it is they're trying to ban or whatever. Yes, that's right. So the Lao concept of culture, President Gaison Ponvihan had this phrase, the best of the old and the new. So the idea was that Laos would be this very cosmopolitan country that would look all around the world for inspirations about people doing a good job, good examples, and select the very best of that and also review their own cultural traditions and select the very best and be prepared to throw out everything that wasn't the best and and be prepared to adopt what was the best from elsewhere. So that's a very different approach 
to the question of what is culture, what's the point of culture. I think in liberal countries, the idea of authenticity has been very important in how people understand culture. So for Indigenous people in Australia, I think there's this sort of impossible standard if you like, even in the legal system, say when people in, in Australia try to put in a native title claim to own their traditional lands, they're asked to show that they, you know, to give legal proof, docu- documented proof of cultural continuity, a continuing cultural connection to the land that's persisted from the earliest sort of colonial observations of these people right up to the current day. So culture in this sort of liberal understanding is sort of this inner unchanging authenticness whereas I think what the socialist concept of culture has given to Laos is the idea of culture as an achievement and as a conscious decision about what you're going to keep and what you're going to throw out and a striving part of the de- definition of being cultured is just trying to be the best that you can be and an openness sort of to experimenting and I think in the case of Gandon this has given them a real freedom to to retain the sense of themselves as Gandu people but without having to fit into this cultural slot of the exotic other and so it's called it's one it's Sekong province's first certified culture village and so this is like in Lao, it's Ban Watan Chum, and then you translate it into English, and it's culture village. Sometimes you get tourists showing up at Gandon and they're like, okay, I want to see an ethnic Gandu culture village. You know, where is your culture? And what they have is Lao style houses or even increasingly concrete and brick houses. They have road, they have irrigated rice. They're actually a lot more modernised even than my first village where I did field work, which was ethnic Lao. In that case, they had no electricity no mobile phones, no tractors. Everything was by hand and with buffalo. Whereas in Gandan, everything's actually quite modern by Lao standards. And there's nothing visible that makes you go, oh, this is cultural difference. Do you know what I mean? The, it just looks like a, a rural village. But And so a lot of tourists, I think, I mean, there's, there's the community hall, which has a thatch roof. But apart from that, it, you know, there's nothing that screams culture to a Western eye coming from a sort of from that liberal politics of culture which assumes authenticity resides in some sort of a deep founded and unchanging difference that's not what is meant by culture village in Laos what's meant by culture village in Laos is it's actually a very bureaucratic um, definition a culture village is composed of 80 percent culture families and families are certified as cultured if they fulfill a number of things such as sending kids to school sanitation participating in the annual festival being literate, um, having a TV set. So so it's like a kind of a mixture of having your own traditions but also being aware of and open to the best from other places as well. I believe in, in your book you talk, you use the example of these are very common, maybe not so much now, but in some places, like in South Africa, they'll have a, you know, like an indigenous village there of maybe the, the house of people. And what people expect when they go there to, for it to be authentic is that the people have to be essentially living as if they were living as their community did. 200, 300 years ago. And that's only authentic. Just like in Canada, we have similar things like that uh, for Indigenous people where there's like recreations of that authentic life, which of course has changed dramatically, constantly over the past several centuries. So that's a very interesting observation. I'm thinking about um, what you said about how they um, view culture as an achievement. Drawing this back to the way socialists spoke in the 20th century, not so much now, but the word, the phraseology they would use is backward. That you know, we uh, in Russia or whatever, our, our culture is backward, as in it's like you know, it's past facing. And for us to like develop our culture, we need to be moving like forward. So it's kind of the opposite of this, you know, this so-called authenticity, which is looking at the past and and not the future. Uh, so yeah, I thought that was a very uh, interesting uh, aspect of your book when uh, when you clarified that distinction. Similar to that that episode that I'd done on the indigenous peoples of the Soviet Union. Union. Um, there's a concept of Sovietization in which all people, including ethnic Russians, were expected to change in certain ways. Was that the policy of the Laos government or were people or were the ethnic minorities Laosified? I'm not sure if, if you understand, but like, were they asked to like assimilate or was it something else? An anthropologist called Grant Evans used the, the phrase Laosization. So this was an ugly word, but very popular when I was starting my studies. Look, I think each each area will have its own history. 
So the history of socialism in Laos didn't begin in 1975. I guess the people who've listened to this podcast will have a good grip on that by now. But surprising how many people come to Laos thinking that, you know, the history of socialism is quite shallow. And in fact, Grant Evans himself, in a book, a couple of books on, on socialism that came out in the 1990s, he wrote like Lao Peasants Under Socialism and Agrarian Change in Socialist Laos. And in both of those, he said, oh, the roots of socialism are really shallow in Laos and they've been easily pulled up. But I think if you look at the example of Gandon, you see it's not shallow at all. It goes back to the 1940s. You know, this is several generations now. You know, people, the people like WePAT have lived their entire lives under this, the, the struggle and then the, and then the post-war period. Yeah. So the question of like what culture change has been demanded of ethnic minorities, I think comes back to the individual histories of how they engage with the movement. So in the case of Gandon, I've already given the example about how it was very important for the socialist cadre and the revolutionaries who were coming up to the mountains that they could find hospitality there. That was a big cultural change that was asked of the Gatu. And I found when I was doing my field work in the, you know, from 2011 onwards, this was something that the older generation came back to quite a lot. At first, I couldn't understand why they kept telling me this. Like they would, they would be like, oh, see this carving of two snakes together? That means in the past, we only married people from our own village. But now women are marrying people from all over the place, you know, and, um, and these marriages to outsiders, of course, went back, especially to the war period when there are a lot of soldiers moving through Gandon territories. So that woman that we were talking about before who gave birth in the forest alone, she married a man that she only knew for like one day before he went off to fight and she got pregnant. And and um, But they're still married today, but he wasn't from Ban Gandon. So I think it's left a deep emotional impression and that people still talk about today and it's left its traces in Gandon families that Part of joining the revolution was losing that sense of the endogamously marrying independent, fiercely independent, isolated village and becoming part of this more integrated regional movement. And I'm not sure that people are like completely reconciled to that still. Like I'm not sure it's a 100% positive feeling. It's just remembered as a very significant change for them culturally, emotionally, personally. So we've covered some of the history and present day and even past experiences of life in uh, Laos. Let's talk about governance and political participation of the populace. What does the socialist political process in Laos look like and what forms of popular mechanisms govern the country today? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So thanks to this project that I did with um, Ban Gandon and this epiphany I had that I really needed to understand Laos as a socialist country in order to understand the things I wanted to understand, like grassroots politics and and um, the culture of politics and this sort of thing. So I was fortunate enough after this to be funded to do a research project in Vientiane, in the city, interviewing policymakers about policymaking processes. We had a fantastic team member who's Australian Lao who helped us read um, contemporary Lao newspapers and we also identified a number of classic political philosophy texts in Lao to be translated into English. So through this, you know, we tried to pull out the main themes of contemporary day policymaking processes in Laos. Some of the main themes we identified are consultation. So there's a lot of consultation processes before things like strategy documents are brought out by the ministries. And these sort of continual, like as soon as they finish one strategy document, they sort of start consulting on on how it's in, on the implementation process and whether it's living up to its goals and this sort of thing. The Lao government has started, I think since 2015, a hotline to the National Assembly where everyday people can call up um, to the National Assembly with their concerns. And in our research, looking at newspaper articles and and interviewing policymakers about where the impetus for policy change comes from. We identified what they call hot topics, but then Horn as one of the important motivators for policy change. So people, policymakers talked about how an issue would be raised either through a consultation process or through a lot of citizens calling the national hotline. And this would be picked up by a place like the National Assembly and Assembly people would start talking about it in the National Assembly and bringing attention to this issue that had been raised. And then policymakers in the ministry would be asked, you know, go and investigate this. We need a policy response to this sort of thing. So we did find the policy was very reactive to, I guess, what they call hot topics. Um, so it's very responsive. And then we took a deep dive into what do they even mean by policy? Because the word nanubai 
has some unexpected meanings, I guess, in everyday speech. You know, it's possible to say, what's a good example? Say the example that's often given is if you're caught riding a motorcycle with no helmet in Laos and the policeman pulls you over, you can say, oh, oh my goodness, I forgot my helmet because I'm in such a rush to go and see my relative who's at hospital and I forgot my helmet. So can you nanny buy that for me? Can you policy that for me? So to policy something for you means, you know, can you waive that fee or can you give me a special arrangement. And so we looked into, you know, this is a very common part of everyday speech. Like when my PhD student, for instance, overstayed his visa by one day accidentally. And when he was trying to leave the country, the guy was like, oh, you've overstayed. You know, I should charge you for this. And then he's like, but I'm not going to. I'm going to policy that for you. And then you buy a high die. There's this idea that sort of flexibility, kindness, compassion is indicated by the word policy. And that's really different to the Australian context. While I was doing this research, I needed to get another laptop because Envivo wouldn't work on my existing laptop. I had to get a second laptop. And I said to, I had the money, so I went to buy it. And the university um, finance people were like, well, you can't buy it because this university has a one laptop policy. So the way that they were using the word policy was like, even if you have the money, we can't help you buy this because we have a policy which is inflexible and which does not, you know, it does not take into account people's individual needs. Whereas the meaning of policy in Laos is almost the opposite. It's like, how are we responding to a specific situation, a specific hot topic, a specific person's needs? Using the power and the means that we have at our disposals, how can we help in this circumstance? So it doesn't have this sort of depersonalized hovering above with no consideration of of the individual or the specifics kind of meaning that it has in English. So then we were like, how did policy come to have this meaning in Laos? Because if you look into the etymology of the word nan um, ubai, um, ubai is just a nanu ubai. So ubai is just a, a means of doing something. And, and, the, and the nan comes, a prefix comes from a, a plan. So it just means a plan of how you're going to do something. So we think, and if you look in the dictionary, that's exactly the meaning of it, like a plan of how you're going to do something, the way you go about doing something. So we're like, well, how does it have this everyday meaning of, of helping and, and being responsive? And we were able to interview the most excellent source on this, who was a woman who was a, a novelist and a short story writer who, who worked in the Ministry of Culture after 1975. She also ran a popular magazine before the revolution. So she's very attuned to Lao language. And then she went and worked for the government and she wrote short stories for the government. And in one of them, she used the word nanubai um, in the case where a girl did not get into medical school based on her marks alone. But then she went to ask a high ranking official to nanubai it for her and he gave her a place and a scholarship. So that was nanubai, that was policy. He policied it, it for her in response to her sort of earnest desire to study. So we might look at that and say corruption, but she was using the word nanubai. And we asked her, why did you use the word nanubai in that sense? And she said, well, that was the meaning that they wanted to attach to policy at that time in the early revolutionary days. They wanted policy to mean how are those in power going to help you? So they actually, I think it's incredible. Like they they took this really dry, almost offensive word, which in Australia is still used to be, mean the reason why nobody's coming to help. It's just our policy. Sorry, I can't do anything about that. It's our policy. They took this word and changed it, gave it a new meaning, which is like basically that you can bring your demands to those in power and ask for help. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, that is incredibly interesting. And like, and <laughs> I'm thinking about it from the perspective of someone who lives in a, a liberal democracy that like you just mentioned that it's like how people in power can help you. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, why, why isn't that the case? Um, exactly. Like say for example, in the U- in Canada or the US or Australia, like why isn't that the first, that the first thing that we would think about um, yeah. uh, of what to expect from government? So one kind of thorough, thorough line or through line I'm seeing between uh, Laos and other socialist countries, Cuba, China, is they're very big on consultation and having various mechanisms to hear from people and to actually address them in, in some way. Again, um, <laughs> living in the liberal democracy, it seems odd that that's like, or it seem like maybe it shouldn't seem odd, but it does seem odd that that is the case. Um, at least in my local context, I've you know tried to contact my local representatives and send them emails, and I know none of it is actually taken uh, into account, or there's no there's no reaction, there's no reactive uh, mm. 
element uh, to my connection to my local leadership. So I find that incredibly fascinating. So do you see any other or or what are things that come to mind for you comparing the situation in Laos, at least the mechanism you've just explained and living in a liberal democracy? I would say it's um, the cultivation of the grassroots and the, the concept of solidarity. So solidarity is not just an empty word in Laos. It can be an empty word, like everything can be. But you saw it in the COVID epidemic, the, the payoff of this decades-long investment in building people's sense that they can act together with solidarity as a group. So during COVID, like entire villages were deciding on their own quarantine and isolation strategies. You know, I cannot imagine that from where I live in liberal Australia. I live in a small town of a 1,000 people, similar size to Gandon. I cannot imagine us having the capacity to sit down together and say during the pandemic, you know what, we could be free in our village. We just need to stop people from the city coming down. Why don't we just put a quarantine sign up on the road and not let people come in? <laughs> like we do not have the organisation capacity to, to make decisions like that. So whereas in Laos, people are constantly asked to, to work together to decide on their own local self-governance questions. So like road maintenance, for instance, routinely is the responsibility of the people who live next to that road. And so, you know, one day a year, everybody will have to go out and work on the road. So you could say, oh, this is just a continuation of Corvée. And in many ways, that's how I, I saw it when I first arrived in Laos. But what I now see after a couple of decades of living there and seeing the pay- payoff during COVID is what these sort of regular routine administrative practices are doing is giving people the tools to solve problems locally through cooperation. And I just think it's it's tremendous and it's so inspiring. So in Gandon, as I said, they had a cholera outbreak. But when the, so of course, from a liberal perspective, you're like, oh, they were resettled and they had a cholera outbreak. And that's how a lot of the writing about this village was before I did field work there. <laughs> but when, but when we, so I asked Weepat, I was like, isn't it true that a lot of people died after you relocated? He was just, he just responded to me like, you want to talk about dying up in the old village? That's where we had a lot of people die. Like he said, since they relocated, none of his own children have died and yes of course they had problems when they when they relocated but they didn't stop trying and he was really proud to talk to me about how in the end the village got a clean water supply through their own initiative like they did ask the the Lao government for help and they tried to put down boards and they asked international NGOs for help and I think the Red Cross got involved for a while trying to sink a, a, a well but he was very proud to say that in the end the solution that worked was the was the village itself raising money to buy a particular spring from a neighboring village and then they maintain it every year by refreshing the charcoal filter which it runs through it's a very complex system which they run on a village level and it brought him tremendous joy to tell me this story. I interpret that as an example of living socialism in Laos. So it's not about this sort of centralised government telling everybody what to do. It's about this investment in the grassroots of saying, if you've got a problem, can you solve it yourself? And this from a liberal perspective, it's very confronting. When I first went there, I was like, why are these poor people being told to do everything themselves? They're poor. Come on, just give them something, help them out. <laughs> and 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 I'm all for like helping people out and giving people stuff. But but this what they've also done in terms of um, giving people the tools and the language to work together as a group, I think is um, has really strengthened um, their ability to respond to um, crises like COVID and who knows what else in the future. Again, I feel like this is another common misunderstanding or maybe um, impression people have when you mention communism or socialism, that there is a central authority and that they're able to, that they, they have the power and they have the will to impose things. Every last detail of someone's life, the Soviet Union was presented this way. China is still presented that way. And I'm sure you've come across that in regards to Lao, but it seems like that's not the case, um, at least when it comes to these elements of self-governance. Absolutely. Like in under the Lao constitution, villages and local communities are empowered to promulgate their own local ordinances. Obviously, these can't be in contradiction to the central decision-making processes, but, but they are empowered to make a lot of decisions on their own, such as um, when the village is going to be closed to outside for quarantine reasons, for instance. 
So uh, democratic centralism has been historically the method of, I guess, po- po- political engagement in um, socialist countries since the 20th century. Is Are these local processes done through a process of democratic centralism um, or is that done at a higher level, like within the party or the government itself? Oh, good question. You know, uh, so, um, yeah, there's like a recursiveness to my research where I'm like, I see something on the ground and I don't really understand. And then I go and <laughs> investigate it. So one of my most recent things that I've investigated is is um, democratic centralism and what that means in Laos. And I would love to get back to the village level and see if what I've been observing there conforms to democratic centralism. But certainly, um, so we've done a bit of historical research looking into this term. And um, we also did some Vientian, like in the city-based ethnography, looking at um, meetings to see how decisions were made. And we found that democratic centralism in Laos is, has basically, because, you know, it's been understood by different people in different countries over time differently, right? Democratic centralism, this one concept, if you like, has been put to use in different ways. So we're interested to see, well, what's it actually doing in Laos today? Our conclusion was that it's a form of decision making which always holds unity and consensus as the end goal. The democratic part of it is a belief that the more voices, the more perspectives you have on a topic, the better. And that there's a strength in democracy. There's a, you know, Gaisal and Pompihan talked about democracy as essential for creative solutions to problems and responsiveness and for things to be appropriate to a local situation. You need the democratic element. You need people to be giving their feedback and their opinion. So that's the democratic part of it. The centralist part of it is the idea that once a decision has been made, everybody gets behind that. And so there's a period, we spoke before about consultation, there's often these are very extensive and drawn out. There's a long period of consultation where not only local people, but people at all levels of government and international partners as well consulted about their opinions. But all of these comments will then be summarised. Summaries are a really big part of meetings and consultation processes in Laos. And these summaries are not presented in a way that makes it clear who said what. The summaries really are taking it all and mushing it all together so that there's a kind of result from the meeting. So you can see right there the end goal of unity in that people are not, you know, identified as different factions in competition competition with each other. People are people when people present their views in consultation meetings, they do so in a way that people described it as being responsible. That's the word they use. People are responsible for their comments. And what they meant by this is you don't present your comments in a way that is offensive. You don't attack people. You don't belittle or undermine them. And I'm only pointing this out because you I don't know if you've seen any YouTube clips of the Australian <laughs> Parliament, but those kind of personal attacks, belittling each other, making fun of each other, is just a day-to-day aspect of, of politics in Australia. But <laughs> but in Laos, people are like, no, you have to be responsible for your comments. So they have to be informed. People have a great respect for science. There's a lot of demand for scientific research to go into these debates. They don't use the word debate. They use the word um, opinions or viewpoints. People put forward what they see, quam hen, quam kit, your thoughts and, and viewpoints, rather than putting forward arguments or debates. So you see, so we interpreted that as the consultations are really framed with uh, the end goal of unity in sight. The idea is that even if there's a lot of different opinions brought forward in these democratic processes, that in the end, the goal is unity and moving forward. So I'd say that's where democratic centralism is really different from the kind of democracy we have, say, in liberal settler states like Australia. So the Canadian parliament, it acts just like the Australian or the British one. It's, yeah, it's a quite chaotic and everyone's yelling at each other. I did have the chance to go see my local legislature for the province I live in and they have like a seating gallery for people to attend. And like, I literally cannot hear what people were saying because the other side was just yelling. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, exactly. I showed some of those YouTube clips um, to, to my collaborators in Laos, like the co-researchers from the National University of Laos and they were just like speechless. They were just didn't know what to say. <laughs> so um, p- part of what we said is, is that when you participate in these consultation meetings, which a lot of foreigners in Laos are regularly invited to go to these consultation meetings, and often they don't know you know, they get frustrated. Um, they think that it's just another pointless meeting or they think they're not being heard because all of their comments just get folded into this generic summary at the end. You know, they often conduct themselves in in what 
appears to Lao people as quite an aggressive confrontational way. So what we were trying to say is if you want to be effective in Lao consultation meetings, you have to understand that you're presenting views in a way that that allows the possibility of a consensus in the end. Like never take up a position where no, like you've got an enemy who's absolutely on the other side who like you'll never see eye to eye. That's just not going to get you anywhere if you want to be effective in Lao politics. Is Lao a one-party state? I wasn't sure about that. I can't remember. It is. Yeah. The Lao People's um, Revolutionary Party is the only legal party in Laos. Um, in the National Assembly, there are some independents elected every term, but they don't represent a party. How have you seen that Like, play? Like, what is an observation of it being one party? Is it I guess maybe a reflection of what you've already said or like what's what stands out? What stands out is that that means being part of the party is a major step. It's not taken undertaken lightly and and the people who are part of the party are very, many of them are very active. I would say compared to my experience in Australia with political parties where, you know, most people are not part of a political party and if they are part of a political party, very few of them get a sense that they can really influence that party. Do you know what I mean? Like they're just like, yeah. they're just given the role of raising funds and door knocking maybe if they're really keen. Most people are completely passive and don't do anything for their political party. Whereas in Laos, if you're part of the political party, there's regular mobilizations where people are sort of called up to be part of the latest drive or push. These are things that I actually, as an outsider, I'm not part of the Lao People's Revolutionary Party. I actually find it really hard to understand what these drives are all about, but they call them mo- like mobilizations. So like the current one is the three bills, Sam Sam, and it's a party drive. And it's all about building up the grassroots out in the countryside, out in remote areas to, I don't know, it's a big push for development. Like I, I actually, as I said, it's really, if you're not part of the party and sort of having these conversations all the time with people, it's very hard to understand what they're doing. But from the outside, I can tell you that they're extremely dedicated and hardworking and, and self-sacrificing. You know, so I read a lot of Lao literature and, you know, there's stories about, you know, women who are, who are party members who leave their children so that they can go and get degrees abroad and that sort of thing, you know. So they, you know, people really sort of put their family and personal lives on hold so that they can participate in these sort of efforts. Um, so I'd say that's one thing that I noticed that's different between a single party state and a multi-party state is that in a single party state, if you do happen to be part of the party, often this can mean you're a lot more politically involved than is possible in a multi-party democracy or not possible, it just seems to happen in multi-party democracy. And um, the other thing I would say is we did, a, we did some reading about like what does Lao political philosophy have to say about single party state versus multi-party state? How do they justify it? And what they said is that multi-party democracies are not real democracies because different parties actually end up just representing different class interests. And so they will always be opposed to one another. They will never have the possibility of consensus decision making. And so that's not real democracy because when one party is in power, they're just representing one segment of society and, you know, doing as much damage as they can to the other other segments of society. And this is just going to instill continual conflict where there's no chance of all people having their voices heard. There's always going to be one or two dominant voices dominating the others. And they said this will eventually lead to conflict, strife, civil war and and an autocratic regime. So they see them they see the single party system as defending chance for real democracy, which they understand as real input by all all classes, all people in society into decision-making processes in in an ongoing fashion. That was a great answer. Thank you. What are some political philosophy writings or writers you can recommend for our listeners to read? Because I'm interested in reading some now. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So one of our research questions for my most recent recent project was, what is the Lao political philosophy canon? Like if you're going to be a politician or a bureaucratic decision-maker is there something that you would be expected to read in a similar way to say in China, a lot of people might still read the works of Confucius or something. And what is the, what's the classic in this field? And so the way we answered this question was through reviewing newspaper articles to see who was cited a lot. We read political theory theses. So there's an institute called the National Academy for Administrative and Political Training, which is run by the Lao People's Revolutionary Party. Anyone who's going to advance in the party has to go through training here and the longest courses 
our you know full time study for three months, I think, and or six months, and these produce a thesis at the end. So we got hold of some of these theses and looked at who's cited as an authority. You know, so kind of like in the way that English language theses seem to inevitably cite Michel Foucault, who allow scholars, allow political theorists citing. And what we found is that it's it's still President Gaison Pompeian who died in 1991, but he was the Minister of Defence during the war. And then after 1975, he became Laos's first prime minister and eventually its president before he died. And so he gave, you know, uh, there's been four volumes of his writings. They're not really writings. They're all speeches or addresses that he gave. And so the last one that we have was published in 2005. So these are pretty recent. These compilations are coming out, but they are getting read and cited by people. And so we got some of these translated. That was one of the really exciting things we did in our project. Where can you read them? You can email me. (laughs) I don't actually have permission to publish these translations because they're copyrighted, of course, um, under Gason, but I'm happy to share them with your listeners if people are interested. That's great. What what is Laos like economy? How is it structured? Is it China's in the sense where it's kind of a mix of capitalist and um, socialist in the way it runs its market, or is it just essentially strictly capitalist, you know, economy with socialist ambitions? I don't know. I'm not very good at defining <laughs> economies. Um, the Gaison in about 1986 announced that Laos was going to abandon the attempt to advance directly towards socialism and would instead advance to socialism through a market economy. A market economy, like when I was doing field work in the early 2000s, most people still didn't have, say, private land titles. Um, this is something that was in process then and sort of has been incompletely carried out throughout Laos. So they have they have money and they have markets where people they can buy things. But say in Gandon, I did a survey to look at where people are working and I found in a village of a thousand people, only one person worked for a private business. So almost everybody else, like I think of that thousand was more than a thousand, like about 60% were children and the remainder were all engaged in some kind of agricultural work. Most people own their own land as part of the resettlement package, even if it was a small amount of land. And then some people owned capital in the sense of, say, owning a tractor, which they then um, rented out to other people. And these were often the more well-off families and poorer families had nothing but their own labour to sell out for working on, say, I don't know, asparagus farms or something. But often the the way people have whatever money people have is often linked to the state in some way. So I found in Ban Gandon, say a dozen families got their main income through working for the military, which is quite a significant proportion in such a small village. And um, likewise, even in the ethnic Lao village where I did field work before going to Gandon, they didn't have anybody in the military there. But the main sources of income for people who did have a job were things like being a teacher working for the state, being a doctor working in a clinic, you know, this state uh, and people's aspirations for what they wanted for their children overwhelmingly is to get a job with the state. This still has the most prestige, I think, even though there is private industry in Laos now and private business owners can be very wealthy, the state still dominates as a form of cash bringing employment and it's still the main player in education and and health. So one thing I'd recommend people check out is CGTN has some interesting videos on their YouTube channel and their website, which detail a recent project between China and Laos, where I believe a high-speed rail train was developed linking the two countries, uh, which is a massive benefit to, uh, to both countries and to Laos, to Laos development. So I recommend people check that out. It's one of the, <laughs> the few things you can find online in English that's accessible. That's a video presentation that isn't about the unexploded ordinances that are scattered around the country. So for sure, check that out. Holly, thank you so much for your time. This has been an incredibly extensive discussion. We've talked about a whole range of issues, the experience of the people of Laos, their political economy. Con- we've talked about ethnographic concepts like authenticity and how people frame things. So I'm sure all of our listeners will gain a lot of information from this episode because we've just, in the Western world, we just don't hear or learn about Laos. So I know this will be very helpful to people as they um, study and, and learn more about this country. So thank you so much for being a guest today. Oh, 
thank you so much for this opportunity. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you and, and it's a pleasure to listen to your podcast as well. So it was a real honour to be here today. Thank you, Holly.